Hi, I'm Reverend Jesse Brandon, and you're watching Epiphanies. I'm a metaphysical minister and a life cycle celebrant, and here on Epiphanies, I get to bring my two loves together, people and books. So with me today is Heather Down. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. Now, Heather is the host of the podcast, After the Book Ends, a show where she chats with nonfiction writers about their lives after their books have been published. She also serves on the board of the not-for-profit organization Brainstorm Revolution, whose goal is to allow people with mental illness to tell their stories through a variety of media. Heather lives in Barrie, and she loves a lot of things, including her family and her cats, Jack and Lamb. Welcome, Heather. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be here with Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. It's great. So today we're looking at A Medic's Mind by Matthew Hennigan. Now, this book is the perfect blend of poetry and storyteller, sorry, storytelling, and he can both articulate and write about his personal struggles in a way that offers others insight into their own challenges. PTSD can affect people in a variety of ways. Matthew is able to skillfully paint a picture and provide many examples of the trials and tribulations of first responders and those routinely exposed to some of the more horrific things in life things that most of us don't ever want to encounter, let alone witness daily. So Heather, thank you so much again. And why did you choose this book? Well, <coughs> not only are there traumas in this book, but what I really liked was the aspect that no matter how much a person faces in their life, they can overcome it. Absolutely, I love that. And it's full of serendipities too which is kind of a personal interest of me I think I'm a student of serendipities I love to see connections regardless of a person's belief system they're there <laughs> yeah I totally yeah. agree yeah. yeah so I really loved it and he's an amazing writer so like you I love books yeah. I've been in the book business since 2000 and you know I read a book a week especially Canadian nonfiction. Oh, yeah. And he is such a good writer as well. Mm -hmm. So when those two things marry, the content and the ability to write, it really impacts me and stays with me. Oh, so and I love it. I like that, too. I happen to read everything, including fiction. Right. And there are fiction books that I read 20, 30 years ago, and I still remember the storyline. And I can never remember the name of the book, mind right. you, to find it again. But <laughs> well, anyway. good for you. I have a hard time remembering <coughs> things sometimes because I read so much. Yeah. However, there are a few that stick with me, and this will stick with me. I have met him now in real life, too. Oh, nice. So that adds another element, I think, to yeah. it, and was a little bit involved when he was developing it um, with kind of bouncing some ideas back oh. and forth. So it, it's really a special book to me. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, he's coming to Barrie, too. Is he? Really? Yeah, when yeah. is he coming to Barry? Um, November two. No, okay. Um, he'll be at the Indigo in the south end of Barry. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And will they have moved their location already? I'm yes. Not, yeah. Okay. Yes. And where are they now? Are they in Park They've Place? They've moved already. It's kind of near the Walmart. Oh, in okay. the south end. Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So right. he'll be here if anyone wants to meet him in person. And with everything that's going on in the news recently, um, with first responders, especially police officers, uh, this is a very important topic. I think mm -hmm. we need to actually explore a little more in our society. I totally agree. I worked dispatch for Metro Toronto uh, back in the 80s. Oh. And I know that there are stories that of calls that I took that still bother me and I wasn't right there so I cannot imagine being a first responder. Dispatchers, I've heard from dispatchers, I don't work in this world but I've heard from them and, and I believe that's just as tough a job because you're on the phone. <coughs> <coughs> I, I was involved in a couple that were that were fairly big stories at the time and uh, yeah they, they stuck with me. I remember the day that I heard one of the people that had been kidnapped during a story, uh, during a call uh, that I was working on and uh, I remember the day we heard that he'd been found executed and it was just devastating and I can remember every detail of the call 
of the day I heard. It's just, you know, so I cannot imagine having to be right there and facing it. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Well, you know, it's it's a part of the job and you accept that, but let's not talk about me, let's talk about the book. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Well, something personal also happened with this book in recent times that um, made that whole layer of serendipity come to life even more. Uh -huh. So when you write a memoir, or someone writes a memoir, I have not, um, there's things I'm sure that they put in and things they choose to keep out. It doesn't just affect the author who writes the memoir, it affects their family, people they worked with. Mm -hmm. So they have to think about what goes in and what goes out. And that was kind of something that I know he was dealing with a, a little bit. Yeah. So there's also the question, am I doing the right thing? Hmm, interesting. So I kind of wanted to sign for me. And uh, this summer, my mother turned 90. Oh, wow. She lives in Oshawa. But yeah. they, um, they own my great-grandfather's house that was built in the 1800s in nice. the northern part of Newfoundland. So she wanted to go back there for her 90th. And mm. uh, we went out. The family went out. And it was lovely and beautiful. And I love the ocean. And it's just this beautiful little cove that's you know, 40-minute drive from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I just, just really enjoyed it. But I flew into Gander. Uh, which is about an hour and a half. And I flew by WestJet, and it was great. But the thing with WestJet is they don't have direct flights. So to go back from Gander, I would have had to have like an 18-hour layover in Halifax. Oh. And I wasn't going to do that. Yeah. So I had to go from a different town, Deer Lake. But Deer Lake is four hours drive from where my parents are. My family didn't really have the resources to spend four hours driving me there and four hours back. So I had to take the bus. Oh, gosh. Which is okay, yeah. except the bus arrives later than that flight. So I had to go the day before. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I know this is a convoluted story, but I am getting to the point. <laughs> so I took the bus the day before, and the hotel close to the airport where I usually stay was full that night. It had openings the night before and the night after. And wow. So I had to go to a different hotel, hmm. which I thought, oh, this is a bit odd. Mm -hmm. So I went to the different hotel, which is right by Deer Lake itself, which is an actual lake, and I thought I'd go for a walk. You know, I've got the whole evening to myself. Why not? Yeah. So I went for a walk, and there's something in Newfoundland called Newfoundland Rock Art. And I found this by the lake. Okay. And if you look at it, it's a Superman logo. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the back, it says, post to NL Rock Art Facebook page. And I couldn't believe it because a big <coughs> theme in this book is Superman. Really? Yes. So Matthew's originally from England. And when he has a fond memory of his mother. She made him a Superman outfit when he was maybe four or five years old. Uh -huh. And uh, so I thought, this is a sign. So yeah. I had to take it. Yeah. So I took it back. And I'm thinking all the things that had to fall into place for me to be there at that time to find this rock. Exactly. So I was pretty chuffed about that. Yeah. So I got on the plane. I missed my shuttle to Barry. So I had to get the next one, which was fine. But I get on, and the driver says, we've got to go to another terminal because we're picking up a guy who's going to base board and CFB board. And, um, so OK, so we go to the next terminal. The guy gets on, and he's wearing a Superman hat. And I'm like, wow. oh, wow. This is the next morning. I'm like, this is just too crazy. I can't believe this is definitely a sign. But something else you need to know about this book is um, Matt served in the Army, and he was a pallbearer at uh, a funeral in Trenton for our first fallen medic in combat since the Korean War. Oh, wow. So uh, who served in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So this guy gets on, and I can't help but say something. Oh, I like your hat, or you're going to Borden. He was a sergeant setting up a course. He had served three terms or three deployments, I guess they're called, in Afghanistan. He served with the fallen soldier wow. that Matt writes about in the book. Yeah, just constantly connecting, eh? And I'm, I couldn't believe it. And I'm thinking, OK, I can't be too greedy. There's my signs. And I, I contacted him and said, you know, told him the stories. And I said, you're doing the right thing. But it gets better. Because we have to post this, to f and we want to find out who actually did it, like uh, who did the artwork. Yeah. So we post it on the, on the site, 
and nobody comes forward for hours and hours and hours and there's 35,000 people in this group so okay. we think somebody's got to know yeah. who painted this rock uh -huh. quiet 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 and finally someone sends him a message saying um, I think my friend did it I'll send a picture so she contacts him the, and it was the lady who did it but she had actually disconnected all her social media because she was going through such a hard time and that's why she didn't see her rock posted and after she heard the story of how this rock is going to go on his book tour and she was just thrilled oh, and it made so her day yeah and then the newspaper got a hold of it <laughs> and we found out that she hid the rock literally two hours before I found it same wow. day the same day the same day I happened to be and there you're not even supposed to be there right Wow so it, I'm it's getting just, chills it's just and you know the end of his book is a very serendipitous goosebump moment as well and I just think it all tied together I was so thrilled to kind of pass this on to him that hey you're doing the right thing Oh, that's so, so cool. So is there something in the book that you there, can read yes, to me and I my readers? I would love to, or if that's all right. Viewers, not readers. Viewers. <laughs> yeah. So just to set up the chapter, <coughs> this is a chapter back in England, back in, I think it's Barnstable, where he was born, where his mother had made him in the Superman outfit and how he used to sneak it under his clothes to daycare. And Aww. Yeah. So it's kind of a theme for how he grew to want to be that hero. Mm-hmm. So this is talking about him running around the house. I ran downstairs and barreled into the TV room. My sister was on the couch watching something on the telly, caring little for her comfort or her ability to hear the show over my ongoing battle with the imaginary evildoers. I ducked in behind the couch. The couch in the family room was in front of a radiator. I learned that if I placed one hand on the radiator, if it wasn't too hot, and placed the other onto the back of the couch, I could hoist myself off the ground and into the air, pretending I was flying upward and beyond. I grasped both the radiator and the couch and straightened my arms and took flight. Once again, the sounds of rushing air emitted from my mouth. Looking back on it, that annoyance is likely what led my sister to remove herself from the couch to seek refuge in another room away from her pesky super brother. <coughs> However, when she got up from the couch, the weight of my tiny little super body was too much for the cushioned apparatus. It began to tilt backward and with that sudden shift, my flight was over. I plummeted to the ground below and with a cacophonous boom, that couch made of kryptonite landed on top of my arm and shoulder. The sinister will of the couch broke my collarbone in two. Now drained of my superpowers, I got to my feet and let loose a wail of agony any parent can decipher within seconds. Something was wrong. I ran into the kitchen to find my mom. I was not wearing my glasses, of course, so I bounced off a wall here and there along my way. My Superman days were over, well, at least for the next four to six weeks. Even though I retired my red cape that day, my desire to do something with purpose was still very much at work. Within a year or so of this incident, my family relocated to Canada, a country I would call my own, and a land for which I would sign up to serve. So <clears throat> what was he exactly as a first responder? Was he a policeman, EMT? He was a paramedic. <coughs> so he was a medic in the Canadian Army. I don't know exactly how many years, but maybe close to seven or eight. And then he was a civilian paramedic afterward. Wow. Mm -hmm. Bugger for punishment. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Oops, I don't think I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he had a lot on the go. And, and the first section of the book talks about his army days. And it's kind of a neat way that it's organized because the first section is jacket one. So it starts with a description of his army jacket. Oh, yeah. And the whole section kind of goes into the past and present about army days. Mm -hmm. And then the second section, it starts with him talking about his paramedic jacket. Uh -huh. And that whole section has some stories of when he was a paramedic. Mm -hmm. And the third section starts with just a jacket of unknown importance. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that section talks <clears throat> about 
him getting clean. He was uh, an alcohol, oh, is an alcoholic, mm -hmm. um, and about his search for new purpose. Wow. So, what is he doing today? Do you, I mean, aside from writing, what is he doing? Right now, he has a podcast and he has a, a blog of the same name, A Medic's Mind. He's from Mississauga or oh, lives yeah. in Mississauga, not originally from there. Mm -hmm. So he writes, um, and he's he's basically focusing on recovery at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, um, <clears throat> tell me more about his story. How does the um, you mentioned that he served as a pallbearer for the first fallen medic since yes. the Korean War. Since the Korean War. Wow. Yes. Yes. And was it someone that he served with? So it was someone who <coughs> was in Afghanistan. So I, he knew him, but um, Matt was never actually deployed oh, to okay. Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So he was serving here in Canada. Um, he was to deploy at one point, um, but because you need to be really focused, he did not deploy because he was having some some family stuff going on mm -hmm. so his mind wasn't as focused as it should be and you really have to be on your game if you're deployed yeah yeah so I that actually added to I think what they call sanctuary trauma because his friend who took his place was killed over there oh wow so yeah. that that's tough to mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was that aspect of it and um, it was interesting too in this book because it kind of there's there's two storylines. There's the present storyline, mm -hmm. what happened to him in the last two years, but it dips back into the past. So it starts on Valentine's Day, I think 2017, and the story ends on Valentine's Day uh, 2019. Okay. So it's a two-year span, but you get the whole history of his life. Oh, really? In mm -hmm. that in that two years. So mm -hmm. what what was he going through? In the two years, <coughs> he was um, facing, of course, PTSD, mm -hmm. post traumatic stress, and he also was facing addictions. And he, like most people who are facing addictions, it's just a symptom of trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are in denial. Yeah. Also in there, he, he loses his mother. I'm not going to say too much more about that because it could give the book away. Yeah, okay. Um, which is very traumatic. So he's dealing with all of these things in the two-year period, mm -hmm. but he does um, get recommended to go to rehab, and he takes the offer up, and it, it really uh, turns his life around. Well, he really turns his life around, right? Yeah. By going yeah. to rehab and really ingesting what what is there to ingest. Mm -hmm. um, another interesting story in the book, 45 minutes back home out of the six-week treatment program, he goes to a bar, uh -huh. orders a beer, mm -hmm. and, you know, his hand is going towards the beer, and he just walks away. Really? Bravo. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that was kind of, I think that proved to him, I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, I can do it. Yeah. If I can walk away from that, even on my worst days, I can do it. Mm -hmm. I'm actually just reading a book <clears throat> where the protagonist, uh, her mother was an alcoholic and beat her severely mm -hmm. and so forth. So she's come to the realization that she too is an alcoholic and so she hasn't had a drink in like 10 years wow. but she ha opens a beer every night and just sits with it and holds it really yeah so i think it's really interesting like that's that's really testing your metal it you is yeah. it's, it's fascinating mm -hmm. it's fascinating yeah. yeah and i think the more connected and the more purpose a person can find the more you can rally an army yes yeah, and certainly I don't know, you haven't said whether he's in AA and I don't want you to disclose that, but I think that that's probably one of the best organizations to this day because it really does build that that group of support. A now, community. eventually you've got to come out of the church basement because if you're not looking at what caused you to pick up the addiction, then you're really not changing anything. All you're doing is white knuckling that table. Right. But at least that's that's my belief system. I've spent a little time at the tables just to check out, you know, how I was coping with life and I was concerned that I, I had was on my way to becoming an alcoholic and realized that I needed to look at it. So what I found for me was that it was my emotions driving my behavior. So and that's as you say, you know, based on um, the things that traumatize us, 
um, can cause us to pick up addictions and I think it's a symptom. <clears throat> yeah. I, I really yeah. do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that changes the paradigm, too, of mm -hmm. how you view someone. Yes. If you realize, hey, this is an illness, this is a symptom of things you've gone through, then I think it's easier to show compassion. Yeah, I quite agree. Which I think is very important. Yeah, I quite agree. And speaking of com uh, compassion, tell me about Brainstorm Rev Revolution. Oh, thank you. I love to talk about it because it is a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. So there was a book that was published by the same name that had about 40 different authors from, uh, from all over the world, actually, mm -hmm. including Le Michael Landsberg, who was, um, he used to have a show on television called Off the Record, mm -hmm. um, sportscaster guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we also have um, Deb McGrath. So she's married to Colin Mockery. You might know that name from yeah. Whose Line Is It Anyway? Mm -hmm. They had um, <coughs> a daughter who came out as transgender and she writes a little story about how that was almost like um, a mourning for her because she was losing someone but gaining someone. Yeah. So it's real, and she's funny, she's a comedian. Yeah. And so she write, wrote a story in there too. So we had all these beautiful stories. And we thought it's great that we have this media that we can share it, but let's expand it because when people actually speak, mm -hmm. it, it's a whole different interaction when you hear it in their own voice. Yeah. So last uh, Valentine's Day in the Five Points Theater here in Barrie, we had, um, a program we put on called unconventional love stories mm -hmm. and so people shared their their stories and most people in the book have a diagnosis of mental illness but not necessarily and um, it, it was sold out it was fantastic yeah. and so we have this nonprofit to be able to fund this mm -hmm. um, they've also gone and spoken at CMHA conferences and various conferences across Ontario for now but we're, we're willing to expand so yeah. if anybody needs speakers we're here it's almost like a speakers bureau on that topic wonderful so yeah. it's all people talking about their journey through life with mental illness or through mental illness in their life? That's a really good question because that's where we define ourselves sort of differently from what's out there already. Mm -hmm. It's just a story. It's actually storytelling. Okay. So it's not, you know, this is my life, this was my journey. It's uh -huh. a moment in time. Oh, very cool. So it's just a little story, a mm -hmm. little story. Um, I've written stories in that book as well. One story I have is just about going camping. Hmm and how that, that affected myself and my husband. Um, just the act of going camping, what that did for us. So they're little everyday life stories, but they're those moments where you have an epiphany. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. So clarify for me, do you have your own publishing company? I also work with Winter Tickle Press, and yes, I'm the founder of that. Mm -hmm. So yes, cool. I do, I right. do. Um, and when you work, do you work with the authors? Like, do you do the editing and the and the? To an extent, a lot of it is sourced out. Okay. So, there's a, a large difference, I believe, in a book that you would pick up, say, from your friend who self-published and a publisher. And the difference is the amount of editing and expertise that's beyond even myself. Okay. Um, so I always hire editors who are part of the Canadian Editorial Association who really know their stuff. And they are also the same editors that work for Random House or, nice. you know. Yes. So I, I, I know where my limitations are. Yeah. Right. So I get yeah. experts to come in and do that. And we're, dis we're distributed, it's Winter Tickle Press, we're distributed worldwide we're in indigo chapters amazon um in amazon in all countries so yeah. so are so, you yeah. saying winter or winter winter like like winter tickle now yeah. why did why did you call it winter tickle back to newfoundland so my grandfather um he was gone before i was even born but he was the mailman for the cove oh neat uh-huh so he used to have to go by dog sled in the winter because there were literally no roads into this little outport Wow. And sometimes the weather was so bad he couldn't make it home. So we had a little tilt or, or cabin, um, I guess we'd call it, at a lake. They called them ponds there. And it was called Winter Tickle Pond. Oh, neat. And uh, I actually have a, a Facebook 
uh, post about it because there's a sign there, so I took a picture with it on my last visit. It's named after that pond in Newfoundland. Oh, wow, that is yeah. very cool. And it's different. People <clears throat> remember it because it's very different. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know. So how long have you been in publishing? Since 2000, actually. Okay, and what led to you making that choice? So I used to be a, a grade school teacher. Really? Yeah. Oh, very cool. But I started writing, so I've written books for other publishers as well, and I've written for maybe over 50 magazines while I was teaching. And you, I have a copy of your book, is it the Gratitude Journal? Yes, called Thank You, Yes, Please. Good memory. Yes. Yeah. 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 I really enjoyed that one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And what led to writing that one? So I found out that a lot of things were happening for me that I wasn't noticing. Uh. So when you get in that negative rut, I find that it's hard to focus on the positive. Mm -hmm. And I started realizing that some things that I was wishing for were actually happening, but I wasn't bothering to take <coughs> note. Mm -hmm. So this is a very systematic way, thank you, yes please, as a journal where you write down three things that you're grateful for, mm -hmm. three things that you want to see happen in your life, and then the aspect that I think is missing in other gratitude journals is a way of writing down when it happens and remembering. Mm, nice. And then at the end you can actually do use mathematics to figure out what your percentage is over the 30 days to see how many things actually went right in your life. And so well, the first time I did this, it was something like 90 odd percent. Wow. I'm like, why aren't I noticing these things? Yeah. Because I'm not writing them down. Exactly. Yeah. I have a friend who uh, calls uh, that kind of thing her evidence box. And she calls oh, it evidence evidence of spirit and uh, so I was mourning the fact that I I didn't have enough moments that I remembered and she's pointed to my tattoo that says step forward and she said didn't you tell me that God spoke to you and told you to step forward and I said yeah and she said put it in your evidence box so nice. that's what I did I wrote the story and put it in a physical box so I like that yeah that's really cool yeah. So, Heather, it's time for us to uh, to go, but I just really want to uh, let you know how much I've enjoyed talking with you today. And the book that we're talking about is A Medic's Mind by Matthew Hennigan, and he's going to be here in Barrie on November 2nd at Chapters Indigo in South, uh, South Walmart Plaza. So <clears throat> be sure and look for him because uh, this book is really good. So thank you, Heather. I thank appreciate you. your time and really enjoyed your company. Thank you for watching Epiphanies. I'm Reverend Jesse, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.